Welcome to this edition of Looking Unto Jesus. Today we're going to be looking at three quotes, uh, two of them from George Whitfield and one of them from John Calvin. And these three quotes have to do with the gospel, not only as the message of our salvation, but the gospel as one of the greatest motivations for our sanctification, to be conformed to the image of Christ. So let's begin first with George Whitfield. George Whitfield pleaded, O ye believers, my heart is enlarged toward you. Look to and live much on the blessed Jesus, and then you will live to and act for him more and more. Be thankful for what you have received, but be looking out continually for fresh discoveries of his love and fresh incomes of heavenly grace till you are called to behold the Lamb of God in glory. Now let's look at this because we're looking at a man who had very sound, very profound theology, and that we're and yet we're looking at a man with an unusual earnestness in his preaching. He preached not merely to inform the mind, but to transform the hearer. So George Whitfield says, "O ye believers, my heart is enlarged towards you." That that first word there, O, oh, O oh ye believers, my heart is enlarged towards you. Those of us who preach must, we must come to the pulpit being men saturated in the word of God in prayer. Um, as we come to know God and know his word, he will enlarge our heart towards his people. Because what is a preacher? What is a preacher? If his heart does not carry within it those to whom he is speaking, we need to be men who are not just there to inform, but men who are passionate because we're passionate about our God and we're passionate about God's people. And it is our great desire that they grow, that they are fed. We not only study for ourselves, but we study for those whom we must feed with the word of God. So he says, O ye believers, my heart is enlarged toward you. Look to and live much on the blessed Jesus. Now, what does he mean here? As preachers, it is our our primary task to make a full display of Jesus Christ, especially as he is revealed in the gospel. But we are also to encourage God's people to take their own look, to go into the scriptures. Preaching is absolutely necessary, but preaching is not enough. Every believer must be taught how to how to read the word of God, study the word of God and how to look for Christ properly in the word of God, because we want them to look to and live much on the blessed Jesus. He's speaking here basically of feeding upon Christ in a spiritual manner. Everything we learn about him, about his person, his character, his work is like food for the soul. It's like food for the soul. So not only should they come every Sunday and feed in a banquet, but they must feed every day. Through the great preaching of the preacher, and through being in the word of God personally, intimately, every morning, every evening. Let's go on. Look to and live much on the blessed Jesus, and then you will live to and act for him more and more. Now, here is the key. Here's the thing that I want you to see. From where does the motivation come? And we're going to be repeating this over and over in these next few uh, lessons that we have. The more we know about God, especially the more we know about God as he is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ in his gospel, the more our affections will be drawn out and the more they will control us. They will constrain us from sin. They will be they will be our impulse to move forward in righteousness. They'll be the thing that drives us to greater duty. And this is what the minister needs. Um, I have now been ministering for three and a half decades. 
And there is the battle of just being tired. There is the battle of so many years, so many days, so many hours. Um, what can continue to drive us? What has the power? What message can you hear over and over and over for 35 years? And yet every time you hear that message, it's sweeter. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ and not four spiritual laws or five things God wants you to know, but an in-depth biblical study of the gospel. That is the thing that can drive us, but also that is the thing that will drive God's people. The law has its place. Commandments have their place. The fear of the Lord has its place. Even the fear of judgment, eschatological judgment has its place. But the thing that is to move Christ's people is the love of Christ that is manifested in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so so again, again, we need to be men who study the gospel in depth. You say, well, I've already done that. No, you haven't. You haven't done that. It's too big a theme for you to already have done that. You will not have done that even after an eternity in heaven. If you think you have reached the bottom of the gospel, you have a very superficial understanding of the gospel. There is enough food there, enough meat, enough drink in the gospel of Jesus Christ to last an eternity of eternities. And one glimpse is enough to drive a man even to the point of martyrdom for the sake of Christ. Now, he goes, be thankful for what you have received. You know, this is kind of convicting to me. I'm kind of always pushing forward. I, I kind of always I want to know more of his love, more of his life, more of his power. And sometimes uh, in the desperation, it can be interpreted as an act of ingratitude of not realizing. T t brothers, listen to me. We should be lost. We should be under the wrath of God. We should be living in that Ephesians 4, 17 through 19, spiritual darkness and ignorance and callousness of heart. If you and I have any unction, any pleasure in God, if there's been any move towards greater conformity to Christ, we ought to be thankful for it. Do not despise the day of small things, but we should constantly be looking back and looking at those markers where God has done something to us. He has changed us. He is changing us. He will change us. And for that, we ought to be thankful. Now he goes on and he says, be thankful for what you have received, but be looking out continually for fresh discoveries of his love. Are you satisfied? Are you satisfied? I would say that if you're satisfied, you haven't eaten for a while. Now, that doesn't make sense, does it? You would think that I would say if you're satisfied, it's because you've already eaten. But you see, to feed upon Christ. It satisfies hunger when we feed upon Christ. But it opens up new avenues of hunger. It at the same time satisfies us, and yet it leaves us desiring for more, for more, for more. It is satisfying, but the more that we feed upon him, the more our heart is enlarged and the more it takes of him to fill it. We need to be people who are constantly driven to see more of Christ, that we might be transformed, that we might be delighted, that we might be full of joy, that we might be empowered. But also we are like miners in Job 28. We go down into that cavern, our study to find more of Christ more of Christ in prayer. Why? So that we can take those gems that we discover and present them to God's people on Sunday morning. That's our job. They don't need quaint sayings. They don't need our wisdom from our life experiences. They most certainly don't need a life coach. What they need is more of Christ. And man, that's your task. That's your job of jobs to present the people of God food, but that food is Christ. So we should desire more and more. 
Be thankful for what you have received, but be looking out continually for fresh discoveries of his love and fresh incomes of heavenly grace. We ought to constantly study the scriptures for more. And we ought to constantly be crying out for greater and greater deposits of his grace. And we ought to be crying out constantly according to the need for greater and greater manifestations of the life and power of the spirit. You say, well, we have grace. Spurgeon uses this argument. You say, well, we have grace. We most certainly do have grace. But are we not commanded to ask for more grace that that grace be multiplied? We have Christ, but should we not command? Should we not uh, seek that Christ have more of us? We have been given the Holy Spirit, but should we not ask for a greater measure of his life and power? Never be satisfied. Never be satisfied. Never be satisfied. He goes on. He says, but be looking out continually for fresh discoveries of his love and fresh incomes of heavenly grace till you are called to behold this Lamb of God in glory. That's it, isn't it? That's what we're shooting for. To see him. To see him as he is. And why are we here? Why are we here now? Why haven't we already gone home? I would love to go home to see him. But I am here like you to make him known. There are so many who know him, but no, not, do not know him enough. There are others who do not know him at all. Minister of Christ, your job is not to run around like a little errand boy, but to run around like an ambassador. You're not to be a mover and shaker. You're not to be a strategist and a planner and a conniver. You're not to look at the world and borrow from their supposed success and their methodologies. What are you supposed to do? Get yourself in your study. Study and pray and preach. Preach in the pulpit. Preach house to house. Preach behind the counselor's desk. Preach in the streets. When there's a meeting in your church that has to do with administration, that too must be submitted to the standard of Scripture. Preach what needs to be preached there so the right decisions are made. But above all things, preach Christ. Preach Christ. Well, we were to look at three quotes. We only got to one. And so we'll continue this in our next uh, series and looking unto Jesus with regard to Christ as the motivation for our sanctification. God bless you.